Terrorism is not the problem, it's merely a symptom. There is not a group of people, not an ideology in the world, that does not have some people that are overzealous. I'm not trying to say that this is not a problem, but terrorism is a different and much more political phenomenon that we have to recognize. And we have to resist the narrative that says the problem is Islam and the solution is secularism. That's the single most destructive thing for Islamic tradition, Islamic intellect, and Islamic spirit. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I wanted to especially um, thank you all for being here this second uh, morning for our second day. And uh, uh, welcome to uh, rector uh, of, of this uh, esteemed institution, Dr. Abdul Aziz Barghout. Um, thank you for, uh, for joining us. My topic today, um, yesterday we talked about what is a matrix and why um, do we need a matrix? Today, we're going to say a little more about how a matrix um, functions or seeks to function the matrix approach. Um, you just heard Mustafa Salama's presentation on why mergers of political entities tend to be uh, more stable than uh, membership in international, voluntary membership in international organizations. That's an attempt or that's an example of research in international relations or political science. And that does not represent all that Omatics is, but it's a crucial part of Omatics to promote this research and ask these questions. Um, tomorrow, uh, or, or in our upcoming uh, workshop, we have Professor Ismail Yaylachi uh, from Turkey, who is here with us, who will make a case for Omatic internationalism why perhaps those international organizations uh, may be more uh, feasible, even though they, uh, you know, Mustafa Salama will argue that they are not as stable. So we have, if you will, two factors, feasibility versus stability. And the Omatics approach is to get the best scholarship that's out there, thinking about the Ummah, bringing the best arguments. And in the same way, uh, another qualification or disclaimer I want to make is that some of our discussions yesterday and today may have sounded like this is really a top-down approach that we are thinking about political institutions but uh, that's only a part of what we do at Omatics, although that's a very important way of thinking about uh, the Omatic unity and Omatic welfare, is how Muslim governments function and how they relate to each other. The nation state order of which we are a part, which was imposed on us by uh, the colonizers, and in fact, in many ways, is sustained by the colonizers, who, as I was talking to Sheikh Jasir Auda just earlier today, um, and, and to other scholars who remind, uh, and, and in fact, uh, my good friend Jonathan Brown, that in fact, uh, the State Department um, and powers that be seek to divide up the existing Muslim countries into small uh, stateless further so that they can be completely powerless and they can be easily manipulated. So in other words, the nation state project, the colonial project continues. And um, therefore, the political aspect is important and inevitable. Nevertheless, a very important qualification I want to make is the grounds up grassroots, 
if you will, understanding of omatic unity is equally important to us. It is when um, Pakistanis, when they are uh, being uh, ethnically sort of charged against each other, against Bengalis or against Afghan uh, uh, or against Rohingya, that, um, you know, and I speak of Pakistan because uh, I, I grew up, I was born in Pakistan, I've lived in the Arab world, in the United States, and everywhere we find tensions within Muslims. And some brilliant questions were asked yesterday, challenges that, you know, these refugees um, that, we, that, we, that we have uh, an increasing number of Muslim refugees, this is something that the Ummah can do. Uh, this is a very grounds up problem. This is very much a problem talking to uh, Michael, Michael Kaplan, um, who drew my attention to uh, the fact that we have, you know, the claim that I made yesterday that the Ummah is already Ummatic, meaning that Muslims feel the love for the Ummah, desire for the Ummah. And he pushed back and he said, look, the Ummah is Ummatic in a very theoretical way, and we all feel for Gaza, but how do Arabs, when they actually have Palestinian refugees in their countries, how do they treat Palestinians? Um, and this challenge can be multiplied that almost every uh, country in the Muslim world has problems with other, its, its Muslim neighbors, uh, whether it's Algeria and Morocco, or Pakistan and Af Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. So clearly, we have a lot more work to do than the merger of uh, top, you know, institutions and a top-down reform, although we cannot forget that these sentiments of how do Turks receive Syrians, right? It has a lot to do with how the government, um, how the nation state sees these refugees either as acceptable or unacceptable, right? And I was talking to Professor Ismail Yelichi last night, we, we talked late into the night, um, about how there was a moment in to, between 2000 and 2000 and, uh, to, until 2011 when the AKP government in Turkey, in fact, um, uh, sought this approachment with uh, Syrians, with Syria, um, so much so that there would be articles appearing um, that would talk about why, you know, that would suggest this merger. Why are we dif two different states? Because there have been enough cultural interaction between Turks and Syrians. So my point is simply that we cannot forget the bottom-up approach. Uh, we cannot uh, forget the sociologists and the anthropologists and the, the ulama and the imma and the leaders uh, on the ground who are uh, studying the human behavior uh, and guiding the human behavior. So I do not, I simply mean to uh, 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 give this disclaimer, important qualifier, that we, we do not simply mean to think top down, but top down is often, uh, often the, the dominant sort of uh, determinant of our behavior. Um, so let me start with a, a SWOT analysis of the Ummah, and I want to uh, make this somewhat interactive session, so um, raise your hand and shout out an answer if you think something is not quite right or uh, some idea comes to you or if I ask you a question. Um, the strengths of the Ummah. Today, let's start with, with, with positive, the fact that the Muslim Ummah in fact is um, growing enormously. In 1910, there was a survey done where Muslims were uh, 200, 200 million Muslims, and total world population is 2 billion, so 10% of the world population was Muslim. Today, 
the number of Muslims is nearly 2 billion. And in terms of percentage, that's 20, nearly 25% of the world population and, and growing. So this is one, this century, last century has been one of, has seen one of the, 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 the periods of largest growth in the entire Islamic history with the exception of the first century. There hasn't ever been such a wide growth, such a sharp growth of the number of Muslims in the world and also the spread of Muslims in the world. So not only are there many more Muslims, but compared to a century earlier when most of the Muslim world was colonized, the diversity of Muslims and spread of Muslims around the world is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a bit more. Um, also, although we often uh, complain about the, the loss of Islamic values and Islamic worship, and, and there is a lot of truth to that, the awareness that Muslims have of Islam, uh, the amount of literacy, meaning their ability to read Islamic material and understand Islamic materials, is in fact greater today than in recent memory. More Muslims are able to read and more Muslims are aware of fundamentals of Islam than in recent, than in memory for centuries. Now, uh, in addition to uh, religious knowledge and awareness, which is a result of many uh, revivalist movements, the, the ulama, the madaris that have been established, all this to say that the good work that Muslims have put in, despite the century of umatic humiliation, which uh, Mustafa Salama talked about, absolutely true, at the same time, we have not been sitting back and taking it. We, our parents, our parents' parents have resisted. And if we do not celebrate their resistance and their success, right, we will, first of all, that would be ungrateful, and we will not have the energy and the wisdom that we need from them, from our ulama, and as well as other leaders, who in fact have succeeded. You see, the demographic growth is no joke. The fact that we have 25% of the world that uh, is Muslim compared to 10%, that's an enormous increase. In some ways, it's enormous success. And that happened because Muslims, and often people joke about it, that's because we are good at making babies. But making babies is no joke. It actually requires enormous sacrifice. It requires creation of selves and passing down values um, and holding on, right? If you look at the struggle between the Palestinians and the occupying um, occupiers, you in fact find that the fact that the Palestinians after being bombed and destroyed can celebrate because they have this connection to Allah because they have connection to each other, because they honor their parents, because they know how to sacrifice and have children and raise children, that actually is a superpower. That's a power that our deen has given us, our religion has given us, that in fact uh, has been a great success. And if you are, if you know the numbers in the United States and, 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 and uh, uh, modern world across Europe, Japan, um, demographic decline, or in China, demographic decline is one of the major crises in the world for them. Um, in fact, somebody was telling me that this is one of the fundamental problems for China and one of the reasons why China is turning to the Muslim world, because we have what it takes to have families. But along with that comes uh, another thing that has happened since 1970s, 80s, 79, the, the neoliberalization and uh, globalization is the spread of knowledge, uh, spread of Muslim populations across the world, particularly in the West. And along with that, almost every discipline, whether it's engineering or physics or biochemistry or, or enter artificial intelligence, you have leading Muslim uh, figures, Muslim scientists and scholars, 
that you did not have before. And this is a, quite a significant development if you look at the history of the early 20th century. One of the biggest problems for nationalist movements uh, was that you could not find people who could understand the colonizer, who could talk back and argue and negotiate, and who did not have the requisite skills. So all my, my point is that we, in fact, have many strengths despite many setbacks. Um, one final thing is felt solidarity of the Muslim public. I want to say that, uh, you know, that's a question mark um, because it is true that the Ummah is a matic, but I want to remember Michael's reminder, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way, if the Ummah is a matic, then why this? Yet at the same time, the fact that the Muslim street is abuzz at, you know, with slogans for Palestine um, and Muslims feel for what's happening is, is, I think, enormously important. However, we should remember that um, there are, there's a lot of work to be done because we can like and support Palestinians from far away, but when we have to deal with uh, people who are in our own society, that we, we our uh, refugees that come to us, uh, that we may in fact have embedded biases against them. We may be talking about the Palestinians, but we're not talking about uh, the, the Rohingya, the Uyghur, or the Syrians among us, because they demand from us a change of our way of being, and uh, advantages that we have to lose and compromise. So my point is that that is an important question, but at the same time we should not forget that Muslims do in fact feel strong solidarity, uh, even though we have challenges when we actually have to live that. Next, weaknesses. Well, we've got, we got, we got lots of them, and uh, we can go on and on, but these are some of the main ones, and I want to emphasize the authoritarianism is absolutely, uh, in my view, one of the main uh, problems. You see, whenever settler colonialism, whenever colonizers go somewhere, they have to divide and conquer. They find elite, they, they cultivate an elite from among us that then is used to rule over us through our own uh, idioms and to uh, and that's what's used to hijack understanding uh, Islam so that Islam is recalibrated um, in order to support authoritarianism. And that's very much part of uh, a larger colonial project, but in which we participate. Uh, we, I mean Muslims. And that includes not only the classes of people that are benefiting, but often sometimes well-meaning but uninformed uh, folks uh, who may be religious scholars who, who support that. So I think, uh, and, and the reason I want to emphasize this is because that there is a narrative out there that the greatest problem that we have is terrorism. Terrorism is not the problem, it's merely a symptom. There is not a group of people, not an ideology in the world, that does not have some people that are uh, overzealous and there have been studies that look at what produces terrorism, for instance, and in fact, um, for example, Robert Pape's study, the University of Chicago scholar, who looked at uh, terrorism, in fact, was used by disempowered uh, dem demographies, dis disempowered people against hegemonic democratic powers, uh, because that was the only way to make their point, which is not at all to say that I mean, you had the Khawarij uh, whom the Prophet ﷺ strongly, strongly censured. So this is something I'm not trying to say that this is not a problem. Um, religious extremism is a problem for all religions, and we had this in the time of Rasulullah ﷺ, uh, and therefore for us to submit to the wisdom of Allah and His Messenger and to, um, to, um, to be aware of extremism um, in our own behavior that's part of our religious tradition, but terrorism is a different and much more political phenomenon that we have to recognize. And we have to resist the narrative that says 
The problem is Islam and the solution is secularism. The problem is Islam and the solution is authoritarianism. Right? That's the narrative out, that's out there. Um, and I think that that's single, the single most uh, destructive thing for Islamic tradition, Islamic intellect, and Islamic spirit. Um, structural alienation, the nation state, we have talked about this. So um, I was, in fact, just uh, talking to uh, uh, Sheikh Jasser earlier about how do we deal with the nation state? Because any, this seems to be something that's ubiquitous, that's everywhere. Um, and the minute you begin to challenge the foundations of the world uh, in which we live, the nation state, um, you are asking for too much. But um, I think that's absolutely correct, but at the same time, we must start there. Um, I believe that the nation state is not a permanent thing. Uh, it's not a fixed, rigid thing. It's constantly shifting. And we see that the Euro Europe, the birthplace of nation state, after, the two, after two world wars, had to back off and create European Community and then European Union precisely because the nation state is a very powerful and a very ugly idea. It's destructive, it's exclusionary, uh, and it's most importantly, it, it's unnatural and therefore constantly requires top-down uh, um, top uh, interference and, and manipulation. But at the same time, it's becoming different. So for instance, already in the age of globalization, the nation state has become security forces for multinational corporations, meaning that it's no longer the primary for many uh, states, uh, particularly in Europe, the United States, it's no longer um, the primary um, center of people's loyalty and identity. Right? So this is one of the big challenges we have. So for instance, in the United States where I live, um, you have the Democratic Party and the establishment is called globalist precisely because they resist the strictures of the nation state and there is a rise in ethno-nationalism uh, there. So, but my point is simply this is a deeply contested idea. So for us to think, as some Muslims often say, Nation state is here to stay, there's nothing you can do about it. And I think uh, my answer to that is, uh, or Professor Wael Halak, who is a dear friend of mine, um, and I think that he has made great contributions um, that we talked about, but I disagree with him in the way, in the totalizing way in which he describes the nation state. That he says, uh, uh, you know, impossible state. I don't think that, you know, those uh, um, theories, the theoretical construct is uh, on the ground. In the Muslim world, the nation state is still an aspirational project. It's incomplete and it's constantly being challenged. Um, and other weaknesses that we can talk about, such as loss of deterrence, it's as a result of our disunity that Mustafa talked about so well, I can uh, leave that aside. Similarly, maldistribution of resources. We see outflow of human and financial capital and collective learned helplessness uh, that uh, ails us. Moving to opportunities, uh, and this responds to some of the questions that were raised yesterday about digital, uh, digital media and can, how can we use that opportunity? And I think that that is very much something that is within our power to, you see, whenever there is a new technology introduced in the world, there is a window of opportunity before the hegemonic forces master it and can use it um, for their own advantage. And I think uh, digital technologies in some ways are still that kind of cutting edge. So, the computer scientists, the computer engineers, the artificial intelligent folks, uh, and, and generally entrepreneurs in the ummah um, should um, see this great opportunity in uh, using this technology for romantic purposes. We are, as uh, uh, Ustaz Anur al mentioned in the opening speech in this transitioning world order, 
from unipolar to world order, which we see, I think, is a great opportunity. Uh, as I said, weakening of the nation state order, uh, or rather, I should say, at least the transitioning of the nation state order, all of these, I think, are great opportunities. Um, fourth Industrial Revolution has led to tremendous developments, which I'm not going to go into, but I've written about it if you're interested. Uh, and uh, finally, um, the rise of what I call globally empowered Muslims, or GEMS. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Um, threats, plenty of threats. I'm not going to dwell on them because we all recognize, but I want to simply point out that uh, the genocide uh, that we are witnessing in, in, in Gaza uh, is merely a symptom. And in fact, I want to acknowledge some people came to me yesterday and rightly pointed out that we have emphasized Gaza but what about Sudan? What about Rohingya? What about the Uyghur? What about Kashmir? And you're absolutely right. Uh, the Ummah is bleeding everywhere. And uh, as Muslims, they're all equally close to our hearts. So we, we use the metaphor of, of Gaza precisely, uh, simply because it is active in, in, in people's minds and because the Palestinians have been resisting and because if you will, the clarity of the situation, because people most, mostly know about it, but if, 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 people, if I were to explain Kashmir to most people, um, you know, it, it, because we haven't done enough work, and that is a limitation. That's something that the Ummah has, uh, has certainly to, to address. But there are many uh, such threats. I remember John Esposito once told me that I was talking to, you know, um, Samuel Huntington writes in his book, Clash of Civilizations, that Ummah has bleeding borders. And so John Spasito, who's sort of an you know, apologist for Muslims or wants to defend Islam, he says, this is a horrible thing to say, Ummah has bleeding order, borders. And so Samuel Huntington said, yes, I was nice, that's why I didn't say, but it has bleeding innards too. Which is a horrible thing to say, but it's true that inside is bleeding as much as the borders, what are you defending? Um, so proliferation of failed states and loss of uh, remaining order uh, and the spread of extreme poverty and descent into, uh, pardon the language here, savagery, but, but that, by that I simply mean that there is a breakdown of civilization take, that takes place when, there is, when security is taken away, money is taken away, then people do not live out their morals. People have to live such basic life. And we see that, you know, I, I can go stories after stories about you go to the Muslim, a Muslim country where people take trash and throw right outside their door because as soon as they leave their home, they have no control over the street. Um, and there is no investment in anything outside the little area that I can, comp uh, that I can control. And that, I think, is uh, really a, you know, that shows how we have no common, um, you know, there's no, there's no political sense in Muslim, in Muslim investment in the nation states that rule over them. So uh, then let me state some umatic principles. How does um, the umatic um institute seeks to address some of these problems? Um, I will start by listing out these six principles and premises. Number one, we have to recognize that this is a world historic moment, as I have argued uh, earlier, that this window of opportunity of transition from unipolar to multipolar world and the availability of Muslim uh, um, skill among Muslims and what, what, are what we call gems, this globally empowered Muslims, uh, is a unique opportunity. It may not last very long, the freedoms that we enjoy, and therefore um, this is the right moment. Number two, there are numerous blessed Islamic revivalist initiatives that exist within the Ummah. And I count among these revivalist initiatives not only what is typically identified as revivalist movements uh, that were established after uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the abolition of the Ottoman Empire in 1924, but also the many 
uh, madaris, uh, many ulama uh, attempts, uh, intellectual endeavors that have uh, come about in the last two centuries. These revivalist movements, as I argued earlier, have been successful, right? So the idea that, oh, they have failed, what are we going to do now? What can we learn from them? Because they have failed, we got to do something different, in fact, is not an accurate way of looking at what has happened. Um, and I want to say that point number three, civilizational rise requires unity, it sort of sounds banal, but what I mean to say is that the journey to become united, journey to recognize for Pakistanis that Afghan uh, as Muslims, what they are facing, that itself is a transformative journey. For the Turks to realize what it means to be Syrians, right? That itself is a, trans that is what makes you truly Islamic. So it's not merely something that you have to do your daily duties and then you have to think about something extra, but in fact, it is your very fundamental duty to protect the mustad'afin the weak and the unprotected from within the ummah. And when you do that, it's kind of like getting married. When you get to have to live with another person, that in fact is an enormously enriching and transformative experience. You become a better person. We become better societies and better as individuals uh, and as groups, including religious groups. When the Hanafis have to argue with the Shafi'is respectfully, or the Salafis have to argue respectfully with the Sufis, they in fact benefit as individuals in their akhirah and in their discourse. That is when they truly have to, whereas when they pull um, a dirty one and go to the ruler and, and try to persecute the others, religiously they are failing, but in terms of their discourse, they are cheating themselves. Um, so I want to say that seeking unification as a habit, as a virtue for individuals and as jama'at, uh, as intellectual schools, is in fact a, a, a tremendously virtuous idea that is fundamental to Islam, I want to argue. And here I want to recall a point that Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah makes that this ummah is not, you know, this ummah is ma'asuma, it is protected from error when it comes to agreement, but it is not protected by any, no, uh, no single individual in the ummah and no single group is protected from error like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was. So the only way this ummah can be protected from error through, is through the mechanism for amru bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar, commanding right and forbidding wrong, which means this process of unifying and being open. So, um, Number, point number four, it's a complex, multi-level problem. What I mean by that is simply to reiterate that this is not a problem just for Sharia people. It's not a problem for political science people alone. It is also a problem for sociologists, for anthropologists, as well as for, uh, and I was having this conversation uh, yesterday with a sister who came to me and asked from Australia, first of all, thank you very much for coming from all, there all the way. Um, that what do I do as a mother? And I, I said that it has to start with the lullabies. If you cannot sing um, the pain of the Palestinians and the Sudanese and the Rohingya and the Kashmiris in your poems uh, to your babies, you're missing the first step already. Um, Okay, number five, the solution to our greatest ills and threats is not outside, but it is within us, within us as, uh, as ummah. It exists within us as uh, carriers of God's message. Um, and that our lack of self-confidence, what I call learned helplessness, is in fact one of the greatest uh, challenges that we must begin by overcoming. Um, all right, and finally, our method is to change the menu of options for Muslim political and thought leaders. That's what Ummatics seeks to do. And how, uh, let me 
say that, um, um, divide up that method in the last few minutes I have into individuals, social organizations, and Muslim governments. Individuals, for now, this is the most developed part of our thinking, how do we come to you as individuals, as well as uh, uh, universities, think tanks, social organizations, um, and persuade you that there is hope and show you some of the ways and learn from you, collect the wisdom that exists within the Ummah. So that, in a nutshell, is what Ummatics is doing right now in this phase. Uh, with individuals, um, this is very much a proposition, a way of thinking about it, uh, uh, not set in stone, but we divide up Muslim, uh, the, our umatic uh, personality or commitment to other Muslims, not merely in terms of beliefs, because it's easier to hold the belief, um, but also attitude that it's possible that Muslims can help, Muslims can become united, Muslims can do something about Palestine. And then these solidarities have to actually be built um, across lines of ethnicity, nationality, religious group, through intermarriage, through friendship, through inviting each other for, um, for meals, but also through fighting with each other for the rights of other Muslims. Why did, Pal why did Pakistan expel Afghans who had lived there uh, for decades simply because this, this was, they, were, they did not have this sort of nationalist, they, they weren't there when the nation state was established. Uh, for an Islamic Republic of Pakistan, that was a tremendously shameful thing to do, but Pakistanis should have risen up in arms, all right? And how do you do that? How do you create that um, consciousness? Um, all right, so Omatic goal for GEMS, that is globally empowered Muslims. Our goal is that Muslims who are globally empowered, meaning those who have uh, access to a view of the Ummah, people especially, and I wanna uh, draw on the point that one of the sisters made here, that there are 300 million Muslims who speak English um, from almost every part of the world. So that's a new um, sort of, uh, since in the age of globalization, a new kind of solidarity of Muslims who can communicate with each other. Similarly, a very large number of Muslims speak Arabic. Uh, these common languages create a consciousness uh, that people, Muslims who are you know, localized may not have. And we find these Muslims uh, are most eager to uh, participate uh, in the Ummatic causes, and this is our first target, if you will, to uh, increase the number of Ummatic, uh, of gems of globally empowered Muslims and increase their resources, their resourcefulness, their depth, and that's who you are to us, gems. Um, I will, in fact, my time is up, so I'm going to uh, take any questions about our uh, social organizations, how we uh, seek to work with them, um, and uh, Muslim governments. At this point, we do not have a program, but rather a, a, an aspiration to advise those Muslim governments that do want to invest in a nomadic future. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.